点。Suppose you might as well kind of get wrong. You saw this um, last time. Uh, we were making the case that uh, in this final third week of looking at conservation equations, we've looked at conservation of mass, conservation of momentum, and now conservation of energy. Um, actually, the uh, systems that we're looking at are really a combination of the previous two. And so to solve problems like these, uh, it turns out that you actually have to conserve two quantities. You have to conserve momentum, and you have to conserve mass. And the system of equations that you develop uh, is based not on this idea of Reynolds transport theorem, where we can take an envelope that goes around the body that we're interested in, and then just solve for the components that either go across the boundaries, fluxes that go into the system or out of the system uh, to, to some the accumulation of momentum that remains in the system. But within that boundary, to divide it up into a whole series of small cells, you see in the bottom left here, uh, these small uh, individual cubes or squares, uh, where we look at satisfying the fact that the amount of mass and momentum that flows in and out of those cells is also conserved and interacts with the neighboring cell also. So what comes out of one cell has to go into the adjacent cell, etc. And so that's kind of the, the mechanism of what's going on. So when we deal with conservation of energy, which is what we're talking about this week, the one additional component that we add to this is that there are losses within our system. So conservation of mass and conservation of momentum are systems which we dealt with momentum anyway, was lossless. There was no uh, mechanism by which energy could be uh, used up. And in reality, uh, one of the big uh, dissipators of energy in these systems are viscous losses. So something flows, it flows relative to its neighbor, and in flowing past itself, it dissipates energy, which is usually used up in the form of small amounts of heat, which are generated in the same way, friction, if you rub your hand on a table, generates heat. Um, viscosity also generates heat to some degree as well. And so that's what we were talking about yes, uh, on, two, on Wednesday. And so what I wanted to do today was finish off talking about um, these conservation equations um, and put it in, in context, if you like. Uh, because if you're working in flow and transport and porous media, as petroleum engineers and environmental systems engineers are, or in fluid mechanics, as people, uh, energy engineers working with wind turbines would be as well, then there are some set of systems, system of equations, that are important in terms of what you would deal with. And so I am going to stop that so it doesn't run in the background. I'm going to make sure that doesn't run in the background. And so... Uh, as a background to be able to look at much simpler systems. We made the case that this time, last time, that these are grains of are cuttings from drill that are drilling that are taken up to the surface in an x-ray to look at the porosity. And then models, not unlike the ones we just saw, are, are applied to be able to, uh, to represent the transport of fluid. Here is two phases, bubbles of uh, liquid as it goes through the pore space from one side to another. And so, uh, slightly simpler, I guess, than the, the previous sets of equations we looked at, but they're actually rather, rather similar. And so, what I wanted to do today was to um, finish off what we were talking about in terms of conservation of mass. We talked about some of it uh, last time. Uh, and then talk about... Um, other ways to be able to define this in terms of uh, stream potentials and flow nets and also use the same set of equations to be able to develop um, appropriate equations that include losses which ultimately we'll use for things like pipe flow. So that's kind of where we're going.
So you might remember last time that we started talking about conservation of mass. We didn't get quite through to the end of it. And so I just want to take off exactly from where we left off last time. And just to, to recap, um, we're making the case that in this big system of equations where we have individual blocks um, communicating with each other to be able to solve the system of equations, what we could do is we could write our Reynolds transport theorem behavior in terms of conservation of mass for any geometry we want, and it could be a little differential geometry. And if we do that, then we have two components that contribute to conservation of mass. One is the mass rate in equals mass rate out term. And we went through that by looking at inflows on the upstream face and outflows on the downstream face to figure out exactly what that relationship should look like. And this is exactly what it looks like here. And we also have these accumulation terms, uh, which we have to deal with. And we know exactly what these accumulation terms are as well. We, we can get one represents a change in a density when the volume is changing, an expanding volume. We're not so interested in that. Let's look at the case where we have a given volume of this little cube, uh, and we look at a change in uh, density that uh, results from that. So this expression here, so we have the, our accumulation term. And the accumulation is a volume multiplied by a rate of change of density. And we can write that in partial differential form as a change in density as a function of time. And we can multiply it by 1 by multiplying top and bottom by a change in pressure. And if we do that, then what we have is enough to be able to uh, replace that in this expression. So this is number 2. And so if we want to be able to define this entire expression here, then we can add these two terms together. So in other words, volume times rate of change of density plus some of the mass flow rates written for this particular geometry is just going to be the sum of these two terms. So it's going to be volume, rate of change of density with pressure, rate of change of pressure with time. And we add to that this term here, volume, density. I'm just going to write out the same terms we have here. Change in velocity in the x direction, change in the velocity in the y direction, and change in velocity in the z direction. And that equals zero. So what we could do um, is we could divide both sides through by uh, density. We could divide both sides through by volume. And if we do that, then we have a relationship which is just, uh, so, so we got rid of this, got rid of this, this and this, and we have 1 over density. We have change in density with pressure. This is pressure and this is density. So we've seen this before. This term is equal to uh, the compressibility. 1 over modulus, or sometimes it's in petroleum engineering, it's usually given the term beta as the compressibility. Units of uh, 1 over pressure. Density by density and 1 over pressure, and multiplied by the remaining terms. Change in pressure with time plus dv dx, etc. And so 
for systems where you're flowing fluid in porous media, then this expression, which, with, where this is just a variable, uh, what we do is we close the system of equations just by taking another empirical law. And so this expression here is conservation of mass. Conservation of mass for differential volume. If you look at uh, flow within a core, for instance, and you look at the pressure change that is applied along the length, then what that would give you would be a velocity in the x-direction as you change from an upstream pressure, which is P1, to P2. And so the law that governs this was discovered by Henri Darcy in the town of uh, Dijon, I think, uh, in the 1870s. And he noticed uh, in the fountains that if you doubled the pressure, then the fountain flowed twice as fast. And so Darcy's law is basically an observation that the velocity that you get a flow out of a core, so this is a core, not a tube, but a core that contains a porous medium, a bit like the, the overall core that we saw before in the ingrain picture, is equal to minus k over mu change in pressure with length. So the gradient of pressure defines the flow rate. It's proportion, inversely proportional to the viscosity. Double the viscosity, you half the flow. And there's some coefficient that controls the rate at which flow occurs, and this is called permeability. And you will definitely will see that in your future if you haven't seen already. And the minus sign here just says that if you have a positive gradient, which is what this is, this is positive dp dx, right, from everything we said, the flow occurs in the minus x direction. And so if we do this for the x direction, and we substitute for this, then the expression that we end up with, if we use this term here, is just compressibility, change in pressure with time, is equal to k over mu dp dx. And it could be plus dp dy plus dp dz is the, is the full set of equations. So if you're a petroleum engineer, then you'll see this in your future. Permeability, fluid viscosity, uh, compressibility, fluid compressibility. And uh, it allows you to be able to say something about the rates of uh, fluid transfer in porous media. If you're a groundwater hydrologist, then you'll typically see an equation which instead of being, um, we know that uh, the head is equal to pressure divided by unit weight. And if you look at the Bernoulli terms, and we realize that in porous media flows, the velocities are so small, they're negligible. Then instead of defining things in terms of pressures, we can define them as something called hydraulic heads. And in groundwater hydrology, this equation looks something like specific storage, rate of change of head with time is equal to hydraulic conductivity times change in head as a function of x, y, Oh, I didn't do this right, did I? So I'm substituting in this, so this is actually d2 squared dx squared. So it's a second partial. So this is second, 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 and this is head with respect to z. And we solve these systems equations to be able to look at groundwater flow and, and flow. Flow to wells, so you can define rates of fluid into the well. You can pull out a permeability magnitude for that and then make predictions of how long it takes to draw down um, 
a petroleum field. And so this is a, a key parameter. And so the idea is that you can do an experiment on a big block of material, put a pressure upstream and downstream, measure the flow rate, and out of that you can get something that says what's going on. And this is just a, a virtual uh, rendition of that. Uh, instead of doing it in a physical sample, you could do it numerically in a virtual sample where now you try and get the flow of these individual components by solving a different set of equations, so-called Navier-Stokes equations, which we'll talk about. But that's basically, basically the idea. All right? All right. So we have a system of equations now that allow us to be able to say something about behavior in porous media. Let's go back to the notes. So we have a conservation of mass term. Importantly, I guess, actually, before we leave that, is that we solve conservation of mass, but by the fact that we put in this term here, this basically is our energy dissipation term. It says that the velocity flow, there's a loss in the system due to viscous losses, and it's controlled by the fact that the pressure we apply on the upstream side is not the same pressure as we have on the downstream side. We've lost pressure because of viscous losses of flow of fluid through these tortuous flow paths. So this is really a viscous flow loss law that turns a conservation of mass equation into one that's kind of representing conservation of momentum where we don't care about the velocity, uh, the inertial terms. So we've made it kind of a, a pseudo conservation of momentum term, momentum equation without really solving the momentum equations. And it's absolutely fine for solving lots of groundwater flow and petroleum flow problems because the inertial term, V squared over 2G, is inconsequential. It's, it's really very small. So what we've got then is uh, one way to solve those equations. So what we'll do today is we'll do a couple of things. We'll look first of all at a different way of solving um, these kinds of flows called flow nets, which is broadly used in groundwater hydrology and also a little bit used in petroleum engineering. Uh, and it revolves basically around an expression that we've already defined. This is our conservation of mass equation, right? We had before dvx dx plus dvy dy equals zero if there's no accumulation term. This is the way they write in the book. U for uh, velocity in the x direction, V for velocity in the y direction, but the same idea. So this is conservation of mass in this coordinate system. So what we could do is we could try and define some expressions that we can use to maybe graphically solve for the flow equations. And it's used not only in, uh, to look at behavior in groundwater hydrology and, and the and porous media flow, but also to get stream flows that go around airfoils to look at the pressure that you develop on the underside and top side of wings to, to evaluate lift. And so what we could do is we could define an expression that we think will satisfy this equation. And so if we define the velocity in the x direction and the velocity in the y direction in terms of fun some function psi and some behavior of it, then what we can see is if we substitute these two expressions into this continuity equation, then you get this expression here. That's all I've done, is take this. This is u, and this is v. And by definition from these, you can show that this choice of an expression for u and v satisfies this mass balance equation. So you know that it's a, a viable expression to use. What we can also do is we can take those expressions and look at what it means. So this magnitude of psi is going to define a streamline. And what we can show is that along a streamline that the magnitude of this parameter is constant. And we can do that merely by looking at a tangent to that, in which case this flow velocity vector 
which has components in the x and the y direction, scales with the length of these vectors. So we can write just from similar triangles, v over u is equal to dy over dx, which is this. And if we know what the magnitudes are for velocities in the x and y directions, which we've already just defined here, and we've shown that it satisfies continuity, we can substitute those terms into this equation here, and we get this and this. And by definition, this can only be true if the magnitudes of deep psi is equal to zero. Otherwise, it doesn't work out. In other words, this cancels out, this cancels out, and the only way that subtracting something from something and getting zero, uh, if it's the same thing, can only be if it's zero. If it's two, then two minus minus two is minus four, right? So by definition, we've shown that along a streamline, the value of this psi value has to be equal to zero. So it has to be constant. The change of it has to be constant. The change of it has to be zero. The magnitude has to be constant. So if you integrate this, you end up with a constant. So that's the first thing. So along these streamlines, but like, just like Bernoulli lines, the magnitudes of this have to be constant. If you jump across to another streamline that's parallel to it, it has to be constant also, but a different value. So the other thing that we can do is we can try and look at what going from one streamline to another means. And to do that, we can go along any path we want, but we can try and define a geometry whereby any fluid that goes across this contour here and into this has to also leave from the control volume if it's steady state. And so what we can do is we look at the flow in, which is dq, and we can look at the flow out, which is a velocity in the x direction times its area. This is dy. And a velocity in the y direction times its area. We can again substitute these values that we defined before for this stream function. And if we do that, then we end up directly from this defining this expression here. And this says that the magnitude of the flow rate that occurs along this stream tube is equal to the integral of the difference between the stream functions, just subtracting one from the other. So in other words, in going from this stream tube perpendicularly across to this, we change the magnitude of this constant, which defines this, uh, a value which defines this streamline. And that means that flowing along here is a value of q, which is constant. And it's the same as the value of q, which flows along here. And so it's kind of tortuous math, and I don't really want to worry about it. But the, the bottom line is that what we've done is we've made the point that we can define streamlines, which have some coefficient attached to them, which perpendicular to these streamlines have lines which are lines of equipotential. And so we made the case before that when we look at the Bernoulli equation, we have elevation plus pressure plus velocity squared over 2g. And this is constant for Bernoulli terms. Let's assume that we can get, this is actually a potential. So we could think of this as a potential h, which we defined actually when we looked at groundwater. Let's assume that the velocity terms are negligible, the inertial terms are negligible. And now what we do is we have a potential, which is given in terms of an elevation and a fluid pressure, which along these equipotentials is constant. And so these equipotentials represent lines where the potential is equal, equipotential. In other words, the potential magnitude of h is constant and they are always perpendicular to the direction of flow. And the reason for that is if you look at this equipotential and this equipotential, then the biggest gradient between them is the line that's 
perpendicular to each of these and, and joins them, right? This line that would go off in this direction is going to be much less high head gradient than this one because it's the shortest length. The drop in head between these two points is the same. Between here and here is the same as here and here. But if you go there by a short length, then the gradient is much higher than if you go there by a longer length. And so the reason for doing this, uh, it may seem esoteric, is that we can use something that's referred to as flow nets. To be able to draw a net of these equipotentials and streamlines. And the bottom line is that if you can draw a net of these streamlines and equipotentials that are perpendicular to each other, where each of these um, squares are squares, or distorted squares, but equidimensional in each uh, direction, and you satisfy the boundary conditions, then you immediately solve the system of equations for your system. And so an example of this could be, is basically this. Uh, maybe that's not the easiest example. Um, well, actually, let's go back and draw one. We, we're doing fine for time. Uh, where did I do it? I'm going to go back to this. So here's the idea. So what do we got? We've got uh, eight, three. We're talking about energy equation, but this is flow nets. So what we, um, what's the easiest way to do? Well, let's do it. Let's say we're looking at flow into a well in plan view. And so flow, we could imagine from an outside region flows radially into this well. What we could do is we could take a segment of this well and we could try drawing our flow nets to it. So we're going to take a segment of this. So it's pretty straightforward for us to do. We've made the case that we can draw a flow net where this is a streamline. This is a streamline. Are blue. And we've made the case that we can define equipotentials. So this is one here. We said before that we want to draw a net of these things. Let me use the right color scheme. So a net of streamlines and equipotentials, right? We made the case before that we could define some length dl. We could define some length dw. Uh, and we wanted these to be um, equidimensional. If we take Darcy's law, which we've only just introduced, but let's use it again. And we know that the velocity is equal to, let's write it in terms of heads, hydraulic conductivity, change in head <coughs> with length. That's Darcy's law written before. We wrote it in terms of pressures, as you'd see it in petroleum engineering, as this. This is permeability. This is hydraulic conductivity. They're just different terms. There's a negative sign in there as well. But this is the velocity going across the system. So this would be the velocity. So we want volumetric flow rate is going to be equal to area times velocity, which is equal to area times k times the change in head over the length. <coughs> 
This is going to be for single flow two. If we write that in terms of this, if this is equal to delta x, if this is equal to a, and this is head one and head two, so that h2 minus h1 is equal to delta h, then this is delta h here. This is going to be equal to dw. This is going to be dl. And we have dw over dl, hydraulic conductivity times delta h. By definition, we've said that this is a square. So in other words, dw has to equal dl. So this term has to be equal to 1. And so basically what we said is that the flow within a stream tube we can get as just equal to flow rate is equal to k multiplied by the change in head that occurs across one drop. This is one drop. What we'd like to do, though, is we said that we want to solve systems for something that's a bit more complicated. So what we said is that we can make this true if we divide this into things that are roughly square. So the lengths of these individually are equidimensional. This one is here. They're not the same dimensions, but the components are the same. And so if we look at drawing a head distribution, uh, for this, so if we draw head as a function of distance, then on this boundary we have h1, we have h2, h3, h4, h5, and h6. Because these are equal drops, then um, I'm not going to draw this very well, but this is h6. This here is h1. And instead of being uh, along here, if, if we drew this out, it would end up looking a bit like this. So the drop that we have to this point is the same as the drop that we have to this point, which is the drop that we have to this point. So each of these are equal drops, delta h's. And so if we want to look at flow in one stream tube, then the total drop that's across here, in this particular case, it would be k over delta h would be the total system. But this amount here is going to be equal to the total head drop divided. So the individual head drop, delta H, is going to be the total, which is this, divided by the number of drops. One, two, three, four, five. So this is over, we'll call it the number of drops. So we could do this as this magnitude divided by the number of drops, which gives us the flow rate in one stream tube. And if instead of having just one stream tube, as we had here, clearly our whole net is going to look like a stream tube next to it and a stream tube next to it. So here we'd have a total number of stream tubes, one here, one here, one here, etc. So Q total equals Q1 multiplied by the number of stream tubes. And so the bottom line is that the flow rate in this system is just equal to, if we substitute this into here, <coughs> 
the number of stream tubes divided by the number of drops multiplied by hydraulic conductivity multiplied by the head drop across the system. And so this expression allows us very easily to be able to figure out exactly what the flow rate is in quite complicated systems so long as we can draw a picture that replicates this behavior. So this is a very simple equation. How many stream tubes we have, the number of drops we have going from upstream to downstream, multiplied by the total head drop from upstream to downstream. And so if you go back to that figure that we had before, then we can look at exactly, uh, we've come up with some figure that represents this behavior. We know what the conditions are that are upstream because if you imagine this being in a swimming pool, uh, we know that the fluid pressure with depth would be something like this, right? P is equal to gamma Z. So at this point, we're talking about head is equal to elevation plus P over gamma. And so at this point, Z is equal to, uh, let's, let's draw a coordinate system, or H is equal to, let, let me just draw it. At this point here, if we're drawing H, H is equal to Z plus P over gamma. And here, the pressure is atmospheric, groundwater table. This is zero, and the head is equal to Z. And as we go down to this position here, H is equal to Z plus P over gamma. The value of pressure is now high because it's equal to this, but this is equal to zero because if this is our ordinate. And so as you go down along this point, this truly is an equipotential of head because as you lose elevation, you gain pressure head, and they substitute directly from each other. So the magnitude of head along this surface is equal to a constant, and it's equal to H0. The magnitude of head on this boundary here is also a constant as well, because it has a, a height of water here, and the magnitude is going to be equal to H9. This magnitude here is going to be equal to H0. And so in this particular case, delta H is going to be equal to this value here. We know that we can get the total flow rate as equal to the number of stream tubes, the number of drops, a coefficient that defines the material properties, which is in units of velocity, and the total head drop. So this we have. And so long as we can draw a net that satisfies this requirement that roughly these are all squares, distorted squares, and it satisfies the boundary conditions, this boundary condition here is an equipotential, this boundary here is an equipotential, it's a bit more complicated because of this free surface, but that doesn't matter. Then we can solve the system of equations. So we know that in this case, the number of stream tubes, here's one stream tube, here's two stream tubes, three and four. The number of drops going from zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And all of a sudden, so long as you know what this magnitude is here, which you can measure, you can figure out exactly what the flow is. So it's off, something that's often applied. It's a very, very simple way of doing things, and it really comes out of this idea of stream potentials, where the little bit of math we did just made the point that these are streamlines. Streamlines are perpendicular to equipotentials, and if you can draw a net where they're roughly equidimensional, little boxes, little squares, then you actually have a solution to your geometry. And if you know that, then you can use a very simple expression to be able to define flow 
volumes through this whole system, which you might want to know if you're pumping out of here, for instance. And also, you can also calculate the heads at any point within the system as well, right? Because you know that the head here is zero. On this equipotential, it's one, two, three. And so, proportionately, as you go through the system, the magnitude of the head drops as you go from the upstream to the downstream, and you can just uh, scale them across that eight drops that you have, or nine drops, yeah, nine drops. And so you should be able to calculate what the magnitude of this X potential is in the system. Okay? All right, so you'll no doubt see that in your groundwater hydrology, uh, and, and it's also used in petroleum engineering as well to some degree. All right. Um, the other thing that we could do, uh, actually we won't, let's go back to ingrain again. Um, so we made the point that what we could do is we can take a sample and we can measure the flow that occurs from upstream to, to downstream. I'm going to turn it off. And if we do that in a sample, we end up with this parameter called permeability or hydraulic conductivity, which is an average magnitude. Here we're doing something else. Here what's happening is this is a chip that's come out of a well from a, a, a cutting at the drill face. It's been x-ray CT to be able to define the porosity. And then a model's been run to be able to look at flow within this. So the model that we have to use here can't be just conservation of mass, but has to be also conservation of momentum that includes the energy loss. So in other words, a manifestation of what we're talking about in this week as the energy equation. And so we could do that for the system that we've been dealing with. Uh, and I don't want to drive it because I don't think we need to. But I will make the, the point that if you imagine that we have this, uh, let's see, where is it? I go here. Yeah. I'm looking for space to use. So you might recall that what we did before was we did this. We took a little cube, and with this cube, which I'm not drawing very well, but you can do it in a hurry, you'll remember that what we did for conservation of mass we did exactly this. So we defined x, y, and z. We had a velocity flowing in the y direction. And we didn't have to do it for conservation of mass, but we also had a pressure in that direction. And on the back side, we had a velocity plus a change in velocity with y times dy. And also, on the back side, we could have a pressure plus a rate of change of pressure with y times dy. And what we could do is we could write a system of equations, which are this, which you'll remember is conservation of momentum, mass times velocity. And we can also write conservation of mass so these are the, the two main equations we've defined we talked about conserving mass first we talked about that in terms of deriving the flow equations for groundwater flow we said that we put Darcy's law in there to take care of this uh, frictional loss. Frictional loss can occur within this conservation of momentum equation. And so if we did what we did for conservation of mass on a little differential cube, what we'd end up with would be three equations that define conservation momentum. And those three equations, plus one that represents conservation of mass, are what are referred to as the Navier-Stokes equations, after their uh, developers, original developers. 
And what they are, are they basically the, the same expressions that we've dealt with before. If you look at these terms, it's probably easiest to write them in terms of um, Bernoulli. But, and you know that in Bernoulli, what do we have? We have elevation plus pressure plus velocity squared over 2g plus head losses, right? What makes the energy equation different from Bernoulli, uh, conservation of, um, of momentum, is that it has this energy loss term in it. And so if you look at Navier-Stokes equations, then if you resolve in the x direction and the y direction and the z direction, you get three equations. They look horrible, and they are horrible. But the individual terms are that this first term here is changes in momentum by acceleration both in space or in time. Pressure with location. The elevation of something and its body weight. The only reason that elevation is important is because as you go down in something, uh, the body weight of the fluid above you changes. And this is a term which is the head loss. And it operates through the viscosity, and it's really a manifestation of Newton's law of viscosity, which seems a long time ago now. Um, but we talked in the first week about viscous dissipation. So the terms of this represent um, acceleration, pressure, elevation, and head loss. So we have three equations for momentum, which are these three here in X, Y, and Z, and one equation defining conservation of mass. And if you solve those, you end up being able to get a system of equations that you can solve to represent exactly the same kinds of behaviors that we've seen here. If you solve them, for instance, what you could do is you could think of this porous medium as is often the, the case, a whole bunch of Capri tubes. So I don't do this. I'm going to stop it. Whoops. So if you look at this, so you can see here these shaded grains. This is finding a pathway that goes between these grains, and it's this bit tortuous path. But what you could imagine is that this is just a stream tube, or actually a, a physical pipe, that's allowing fluid to go through that. And so we won't solve it in terms of these expressions, but what we could do is we could take these Navier-Stokes equations and we could solve it for particular boundary conditions. In this case, we're solving it for a flow between two parallel plates. And that's useful because that looks like flow within a fracture in rock, like a hydraulic fracture. And you can solve these Navier-Stokes equations to come up with a relationship which tells us what the distribution of fluid velocities across that fracture are. And therefore, we could tell how much fluid comes out of the fracture. Won't do it, but we, we could do that. Ends up being quite a simple expression. It says that the average flow velocity is equal to the separation between the plates, the viscosity of the fluid, and the pressure drop along its length divided by 12. Very straightforward. We could also do it for a stream tube, just like in that ingrain picture. And if we do that, we find out that we end up with a, an expression that tells us exactly what the flow rate is. And this average velocity that we get is equal to, if we write it out, velocity is equal to, this is just uh, the diameter of the flow. And so uh, the, the, vol the velocity is just equal to d squared over 32, 1 over viscosity times change in pressure with location. And so one thing we could do is if we know that this is the velocity, average velocity within a flow tube, we know that the average, the flow rate per tube is going to just be equal to the average velocity multiplied by the area, 
So the total flow rate is just going to be pi d squared upon 4 multiplied by this other component here. And I don't have time to do it, so I won't do it. But I'll make the point that if we are able to figure out how much occurs in one flow tube, and if we can relate how many of those flow tubes we have in this little cubic volume of uh, rock which the stuff is flowing through, then we should be able to get an equation that relates the, f the flow rate to the permeability. And it turns out that if we do that, we end up with the permeability being equal to um, the diameter of the flow tubes squared times the porosity divided by 32. And so these are uh, typically the, the, the size of the flow tubes. And this is the porosity, the vo volume of the voids divided by the total volume. And so if you look at rock, uh, typically in shales, for instance, the permeability of shales is maybe a nano Darcy, which is 10 to the minus 21 meters squared. Porosity may be 10%. And this is almost 100, right? So in other words, k is approximately 10 to the minus 3 multiplied by d squared. And if this is equal to 10 to the minus 21 meters squared, a nano Darcy, then d squared should be equal to about 10 to the minus 18 meters squared which means that the diameters of these pores is something like uh, one nanometer, which is about right for um, shales. The size of the pores, the reason they're such low permeability and that you have to fracture them so massively is to get access to it because the permeabilities are so low. The permeabilities are so low because the pore sizes are tiny. So this is a micron would be 10 to the minus 9, so this is a nanometer, and that's, a, that's about right. And so the reason that we're interested in these conservation equations is because it allows us to say something about systems that we'd like to be able to, to evaluate flow in. And those flow may be open channel flows like we looked at at the beginning today with water washing over lighthouses, which are these Navier-Stokes equations. But we could also use those Navier-Stokes equations in kind of confined form to represent simple geometries like pipes and get an expression that defines the behavior in a pipe. And actually this expression is something that we'll use not this coming week but the next week to look at pipe flow when we deal with it.